Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Massive Masters Wednesday case study. Always happy to have everybody here. Um, we're super excited uh, to be able to share some knowledge with you this tonight. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about triple net retail, as you mentioned before, um, or if you saw when you registered. I know we've had a few things with our signing up and our registration. We're getting all the bugs fixed on that. So sorry for anybody who registered and got wrong time, wrong date. So this is an educational series. We are not financial planners, we're not lawyers, we're not accountants, but what we would like to do is share what we believe to be the truth as far as we've seen it in our experience. Obviously, always ask questions and then always do your own due diligence before making any investment decisions. So if you're living under a rock and you haven't heard, we're having our next Asset Management and Capital Raising course this Saturday in Dallas. It's absolutely amazing course. We've actually switched it a little bit where we're doing the two topics in one day. It was just a little spread out. We have enough information that we can do. So we're gonna talk all about building an investor database, how to build a capital raising machine, the difference between 506 and 50, 50B and 506 deals. And then we're going to switch over and say, how do you become an effective asset manager? And just to be sure you understand, the asset manager are the partners of the deal that are responsible for implementing the business plan. So successful implementation of a business plan is everything about the fact that you are going to have a successful investment. We're going to talk about common pitfalls, mistakes to avoid. This is an all-day event, starts at 8 in the morning, goes till 6, 7 o'clock at night. Um, I'm going to stick a link into the chat, too, if you can't scan this QR code here. But it is something that you really want to attend if you're in Dallas. We are going to be having it again in Houston, um, but uh, don't wait. It's worth the trip, I can promise you. I've got a good friend of mine who's actually flying all the way from Toronto, Canada to do this event. So... Um, it, it's uh, it's going to be definitely worth your time. So sign up and join us this coming Saturday. Yeah, it'll be awesome. It's going to be jam packed, <laughs> full of uh, content and uh, and fun and and activities as well. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about massive capital, a value add to investors and partners. Tonight's underwriting series is triple net leasing. A little bit description about what is triple net leasing. Triple net leasing is mostly we're talking about retail or lifestyle developments. And a triple net means that the tenants are responsible for all of the common area costs. And they also carry a lot of the common area risk. So this is a completely different business model, let's say, than multifamily. So you build something, you lease it to them, and then if the property taxes go up, the tenants pay their portion of the property taxes. If the roof leaks, the tenants pay the property taxes. So it's a different business model. It's a very good business model, and especially in the new development. And then next week, we're actually going to be talking about where are we doing this and how you could join up and do it with us. So it's going to be an interesting evening tonight. And, uh, you know, Massive Capital has a few deals pending. So we're hoping that you'll learn a lot tonight about this. So if you look at the map, oop, the map, you can see we're very Texas heavy. And that's because most of the partners and team members are in Texas. Um, but we do have properties in Denver, Colorado, North Carolina, um, south of Atlanta, Georgia, in Warner Robins. If you've missed the last few webinars, you can find them on our replay, or if you're late here, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So always want to make sure that you go back. It is a really good way for you to learn. So we did the Texas Triangle. We did Denver and North Carolina webinars the last three weeks. So make sure you check it out and subscribe to the Massive Capital YouTube channel. That way you'll never miss a recording of anything that we've done. Um, you'll just get a notification that there's a new video uploaded. So Massive Capital is involved in equity fund. Triple net brokerage. Okay, so again, on the brokerage side of retail and development, 
triple net on the managed property management side. So not on the property management side, but on the, on, on sorry, multifamily property management, but uh, retail property management. We're doing a lot of land development and then triple net construction. And we have tech. And of course we have the massive masters, which is the sponsor of tonight um, with our students. So on the bottom, you can see our partner Realty One, and they're the ones that have the triple net brokerage, the property management and the construction. We've been working with them. They have $290 million in assets under management. They've been doing this for 42 years and they've been able to partner with us. And then as you see massive capital here, we have 200 million in assets under management. Um, we've got a few more deals coming. So that number is gonna change dramatically in a little while. So we are owner operators of value add multifamily assets. And we're also the development of triple net retail town centers. So we're super excited about this. So if you know from the history, 22 and 23 massive capital closed 15 deals. And then we have an LOI accepted in San Antonio, an LOI accepted in Houston, Texas. We have a 60,000 square foot retail under development. We have, a develop, we have an offering in West Texas. All of those right now are 506B. So I wanna make sure that I understand the difference. If you have a relationship with Massive Capital, you can bait, so they call it a pre-existing relationship with Massive Capital. All of these opportunities are available for you to invest. But I'm here to tell you that if you don't, you're missing out. So it's super important that you book a call with us. We get to know you so that we can send you all of the opportunities. And then once they become a 506C, we can talk about them openly on a public forum like this. So we still have some room left on our deal in San Antonio, Texas. So this one here is only for 506C for accredited investors only. Um, this one here we're offering it estimated to be a 2.11 multiplier of your money, 18% projected IRR with a seven pref. Obviously there's some huge tax advantages. Um, if you want a copy of the replay of the webinar, it's on our website. Sorry, I uploaded the wrong slide here, but I wanna make sure people understand this. So if you invest $100,000 in a deal like this. Within five years, we are estimating that you will turn that $100,000 into $211,000. And doing that, you're also gonna have a lot of tax advantages. One other thing to protect investors, we have a 7% preferred return. So what this means is, until you've made 7% cash on cash on your money, us as sponsors of the deal aren't making any money. So we're highly motivated. We're doing these deals so that you can, obviously we wanna make money. We want you to make money, but this is our investor approach. If there's anybody looking to do a large investment, um, you can talk with myself or Michael or with anyone else. Um, we'd be happy to talk with you and see how that we could, uh, we could get everything going. It's an amazing opportunity. We just did a webinar, this last webinar, where we talked about our business plan and it was so exciting to see like 50% of the items checked off already started or completed. Um, that is the true meaning of value add, right? You see something in an apartment complex and you fix it. So we went from a closed pool to, I saw a picture of a pool party that we were doing for the residents with all of the children being able to enjoy the pool. We had a pool with no pool furniture. So there's all the furniture there. Again, that is the definition of value add. All right, Mike, you wanna take over this part? I will try, Trevor, if, uh, if you see me getting stuck or hung up, you may have to pick up or take over. Okay. Uh, but thank you very much. So again, how, how do people get started in multifamily? And uh, just overall kind of objectives of things uh, typical, right? Multifamily, new development uh, together. Uh, a lot of people start in uh, an LP, limited investor. That's how I started. I think Trevor started that way. And then others start uh, directly into it, you know, on more, maybe a JV or a solo uh, deal that they get into. And... Uh, 
And then some jump on the other side and they actually become start in with lead co-sponsors. Um, you know, and Sanjay did that in uh, his beginning of uh, stages of things. So you look here, these two are really the syndication space. In some reality, all of it, even a JV, tends to work as a syndication. It just doesn't have the same label from a, a SEC standpoint. So we're always looking for partners to grow together. Uh, massive Capital, uh, on the acquisition side, we, uh, we do look at purchasing land. And uh, that actually is is even through another one of our partners uh, with Texas REI, part of the the, the bigger group of us. Uh, we also want to JV on development, retail development, Class A locations. Uh, this is two to forty commercial acres. Uh, we're really and towards the end we may touch on that. You know, we're leaning this actually more into the 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 six to six or 10 up uh, to 40. So maybe like eight to 40 acres uh, looking, you know, to do larger op opportunities uh, rather, you know, kind of the same concept now for the retail as, as multifamily or as, you know, the single family going to multifamily, like a little bit bigger, a little bit more, we can do those instead of doing uh, 10 of those. On uh, the multifamily, uh, the Koji side still, you know, we're looking for new acquisitions. Uh, we do have a few, as said, otherwise pending under contract moving forward. But again, we're focused in the 80s plus newer, 150 units or more. Uh, and another area is we, we do have an asset advisory uh, project that we we offer people uh, it's a proprietary software dashboard we we dig into the property management data ahead of time we we bring it into the dashboard we we can serve stand as a debt uh, loan guarantor so basically a kp on a deal and we also provide and lean more into if we're going to kp we want to do everything with you. So we call it the deal doing consulting service, uh, basically includes everything that you would get in even our master's program. So it's kind of a done with you, not done for you at all. Definitely done with you. You're still going to do most of it. The, the heavy lifting, we're going to guide and support along the way uh, into this consulting service. So so now we're going to be talking a little more on the triple net aspects, underwriting your market. And, uh, but a little bit before that, we're going to jump. How do you do group learning still, right? Um, most deals, the commercial deals, whether it's multifamily value add or even the retail, you know, they're three to five years cycle times. Um, and, you know, depending on how you're doing that, and, and the whole process, you know, this is the whole team that you need when you're putting it together and the process that you will go through, really. So think about this when you're putting your team together and, and the skill sets that you need and the, and the steps that actually the real steps that happen throughout uh, the life cycle of a deal from acquisition, uh, equity and debt to, through the asset management process. So to take a snapshot of this, it's a great little uh, piece, just like a good guide to follow as you go through your steps and your process. And then let's talk a little on, you know, this is underwriting, but the conventional thinking, you know, is typically it was always start wherever you are at, uh, you know, within a couple hours of your space, go with, you know, start with what you can handle. Uh, get to know the local brokers, ask for off-market deals, right? And then probably a lot of that still may apply. Also, though, challenge yourself and think outside of that box a little bit, unconventional or different conventional thinking. And, uh, you know, start wherever and, and simulate the purchase of, of a deal. Uh, build your team around the deal, the MSA area, Underwrite, uh, you know, multiple cities even to increase that 
odds. And we'll talk a little on the tools for that. Um, you know, real estate is, is you know, it's hyper local and it gets down to the street. So you really need strong boots stare anyway when you get into it. And without mastering, you know, the underhang, you will not be able to, you know, identify the deal anyway. So it's, you know, continue to work on your underwriting or find you a good team to to work and continue on the underwriting of, of things. And I'm um, going to wrap here with a couple of things on tech, right? Just what we do and what we use. So we use uh, Monday.com to bring all our deals together. Uh, you can get an idea of, you know, our ramping up per quarter, how many deals we've been underwriting, looking at. I uh, believe this is actually almost 300 right now for, this was 300 for Q2 of 24. Uh, the, and about 1.5 billion of assets underwritten, uh, primarily in the, the Texas areas, but also out in, this shot doesn't show, but Georgia and some other areas. We use Monday.com, Red IQ, and Client Harbor is our CRM uh, that, uh, that we use as well. So a lot of tech goes into everything that we do, especially as well, into looking at the, the data, right? CoStar, LoopNet, Reonomy, and sucking that data into your, to your work. Uh, demographic, not just the deal, but like demographics and all kinds of other uh, financial uh, attributes of the areas. Sanjay, I'm going to turn over to you for a bit. If you're good to pick up here. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so how we think of our performa for uh, as we underwrite the deals. Um, of course, uh, I think we have uh, there's another chart we have uh, that kind of looks at the various factors, uh, the property, the location, the financing, and the equity. Those are the four factors. But from a location perspective, you know, on the left hand side, it's it's the the one of the most important thing. As long as location works, it's good. It's uh, is there. And then the location gets broken out uh, by revenue and expenses, operational expenses primarily. Um, and on both sides, income and expenses, there is the controllable and uncontrollable. So from a market perspective, population and income growth is really uh, outside of our control for what we do. Uh, maybe someday, you know, we have big businesses we own, we can change that uncontrollable part for our area, but, uh, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, but, you know, how much rent we can charge, what amenities, uh, what value add we do, we have, we have control over that and we drive that. On the, on the expenses side, primarily insurance and taxes, you know, it is what it is, we have to go by, it's, it's mostly out of our control. Yeah, on the taxes, we can we can contest a little bit, protest a little bit. Uh, on insurance, you can do certain things to reduce it, but mostly out of our control. Uh, similar for the labor market, uh, what's the demand, what the other businesses are doing, paying drives the labor cost, uh, very little control over what we can do. Uh, but all the other operational expenses, utility, repair, maintenance, contracts, uh, other miscellaneous expenses is, is in our control. We can do different strategies, different things. So, so you know, we control that and, and drive that. So go to the next slide. <clears throat> next one. Uh, yeah, so there's the box I was talking about. Uh, from an underwriting perspective, the four boxes from the top left, uh, lending environment, uh, as you've seen, 2007 to 2011 to even the turn from 2022, all of that is driven by that lending environment, right? Such a huge impact on anything we can do. Real estate is, you know, one of the biggest impact uh, lending environment has on the real estate. Uh, kind of in parallel goes with lending is the right hand top box uh, equity availability. And uh, that really means the equity available for us for our deals, right? So 
if there is an option to earn mostly risk-free six, five, six percent return, you know, we wouldn't have much of an opportunity for uh, raising equity on these deals. Uh, if the market, stock market is returning, you know, 10, 12 percent, makes it directs some of the money there and then rest of the money trickles there. So, you know, we have to increase our return if those uh, lending environment, the interest rates are higher and that, uh, you know, our returns have to be higher to match that. And, and we're seeing some of that now as we are underwriting the deals. Location strategy, location is everything. Uh, you know, if the, if the loan is available, equity is available, you always wanna go into the right location. A, uh, you know, with it, given a right location, in the worst case that it can happen is you may have to hold an asset for extra whatever period of time, one year, two year uh, for, for the lending environment to change again. So primarily what we look at from location strategy is growth from population and income perspective. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, the, there's a tagline number for population and income growth, but looking underneath with that breakdown and the detail is important. Uh, what type of population? Is it a manufacturing driven population or is it a finance driven or a specific sector like a medical sector driven uh, population growth, or is it a mix, very diverse? Uh, that is a very important part for a growth. Uh, one sector focus, oil, there are markets that are very oil and gas focused. So those markets sometimes struggle when uh, uh, oil is below uh, $60, $60 a barrel. So it's, it's something $50, $60 a barrel is a key mark for, for oil. Uh, to for the various uh, other investments in oil and gas that drives. So, and then the last but not the least is the property strategy. You have to have the right property once you have in the right location. Uh, what is your spread on the asset, the type of assets um, within the location? How does this property stands? Is it an easy access versus a hard access? So uh, all those factors kind of feed into this. Next slide, Mike. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so yeah, go to the next one. I think this is this is the same. Uh, and then of course, as we're looking at the underwriting, uh, the justice map is, a, is a, a primary guidance for us in terms of various uh, factors that affect. So local economic, local economic power, the crime rates, the A, B, and C, the median income, uh, and, you know, there is a map there. Somebody has done the study and gives us the direction of, uh, you know, what can and we can, cannot do from a strategy on the property perspective. So it doesn't mean we wouldn't go in a, a certain color here. Uh, we would go with it, but our underwriting would be slightly different in one color versus the other. And we would still go in those, any of these colors, but uh, the strategies differ. So next one. So, uh, and then of course, always have to refer to the flood map. So FEMA website has the flood map. Um, it has been updated more recent, more frequently recently than it used to be, um, you know, 10 years ago, how, how frequently it was updated. So uh, really, really important to check these uh, as the weather patterns have changed, as the rain patterns have changed these maps uh, change continuously to, you know, bring the properties with a risk of flooding or not. Next one. Very easy to search this and look up uh, online just with the address. So now the underwriting that we were looking at earlier, kind of focusing specifically on a triple net asset in Houston. And this was a new development in Houston. So starting with the same, the lending, lending environment, the top left bucket there. Um, for, for the triple net in Houston, lenders have a lot more ap appetite for cash flowing assets. Uh, so what Mike was saying earlier, triple net assets tends to be cash flowing assets. That's the focus because, uh, because of its triple net nature, the, for landlord, the variability on income is lower uh, as well as on expenses. 
So typically these are a more fixed cash flowing asset and whatever is projected, it, it kind of pans out that way. So lenders have a lot more appetite for these assets in, in Houston area. Uh, as you compare to some of the other markets, a lot of lenders don't. Uh, even there is a lot of local banks available. Um, most recently we did a recourse loan for, for an asset in West Houston and you know there was money available. Rates can vary from eight and a half to 12%. One point with 25 year amortization, uh, most of these are full recourse, the triple net. Uh, that's one of the biggest difference in triple net assets. Underwriting and um, doing deals together is these are mostly uh, full recourse. So have to be really careful. One of these assets goes under from a, from a GP sponsor perspective that one asset can, can take you down for a few years for you to come back up and be able to do any other deals. So, so you know, it's a, it's a very, very important factor. Looking at a uh, equity, uh, the top right, top right box, uh, on these deals, equity tends to be 25 to 30 or even 35 percent. Uh, um, uh, that's the equity. So higher equity, that has to be uh, brought in. Uh, typically, higher earners, higher tax income uh, uh, the segment that tend to invest in these assets. Uh, open communication, there is more communication on those. From a location perspective, we we'll look for assets that are in median income of $80,000 or more, just because of the evergreen nature of these retail assets in those income markets. Um, we we'll look for the local Texas-based chains uh, as opposed to the national chains uh, as tenants for those. Um, in most cases in these new developments, by the time the construction starts, we go for a location where uh, we are pre-leased 50 to 60% by the time construction starts. Uh, and as the construction starts and the building structures start to go up, rest of it, uh, maybe up to 80% is gets leased. Uh, as businesses in the area, they see the building going up, they seek out the builder and uh, you know, inquire about the leases and, and that happens. The bottom left from a property perspective, the uh, service oriented are, are the best. Uh, so this specific assets that Mike's gonna talk next uh, is in a very service oriented. So, you know, there are four or 5,000 households, uh, single family homes that are already built or already have an approval to build, permits to build. You know, as soon as those houses, there's uh, people move in those houses, there's a need for service oriented businesses. A lot of these service-oriented businesses are local. You're not going to go 30 miles to to a a uh, you know your la uh, laundry uh, your dry cleaner place. You're not going to go uh, 30 miles for a, your little fast food Thai restaurant or whatever you have it. So so you know those tend to be local within those areas, and that's what we look for from a property perspective. Uh, in-house construction, in-house cost management, in-house leasing gives us the edge on the project uh, being vertically integrated. Uh, the more vertically integrated you are, the more uh, things you can stack and the efficiencies of the process are there. You don't have to wait for another team, another timeline to be able to start leasing or, or manage the cost, uh, which really helps us on the construction, construction time. So next. <clears throat> You want to talk about the Condro Commons, uh, Mike? Yes, Anjay, I can. And I'll, uh, I'm going to jump a, a little bit forward here and then I'll jump back. And I want, and the reason is kind of focus a little bit on what you, um, well, no, I'll do it here. Uh, so one of the things Sanjay mentioned is, you know, the, we look at properties where, where you you have a community being built up around that when we're looking at triple net so one of the things you're looking at is the area of the house tops so you're not you're you're looking at um, justice maps to get an idea of the demographics but you're also like looking at like in the area like how how's the house tops how many house tops do i have to support that 
um, which kind of goes with your population and, you know, and our, what is the development process of what's coming into that area. So one of the projects that we have is in Conroe and um, currently uh, we'll talk a little more like where it is, how it's going along, but we, you know, this went under contract and we, you know, this is a, uh, 23,000 square feet. Uh, we're going to talk, like I mentioned earlier, we, we started, you know, these, these are some of the deals we started with. We have the one in Harris Ridge, uh, 16,000 square feet and, and a great, great, uh, properties, great deals. And you notice like this is right near a corner. Um, and the next slide, next slide, I'll show a little more detail on that. Uh, we're looking here the rental rate, so these are 34 to $35 per square foot. This is a, the, the leasing, the tenant leasing rates. And on top of that, you'll be, you you go ahead and figure out what is my triple net going to be. So that's another about $9 per square foot for this project, this area, this market uh, of what you'll be collecting in a combination of rent. And then the triple net is to pay off, you know, pay your, uh, uh, utilities and, and taxes and things like that, uh, insurance. So it takes care of, of that coverage for you, uh, which is one of the reasons I think we talk about right now, we would do triple net all day in Florida, for example, but we're not, we're not, we don't work enough. We don't spend enough time in Florida to be comfortable doing the multifamily just because we're not sure what's happening with insurance, how well we could get that uh, and, and so forth. So triple net in Florida would be ideal uh, opportunities. Um, you know, and you look here, the demographics, it's growing. Conroe, some of you may or may not know, like Conroe, uh, it may show here 70 to 80,000 and it is growing, but it's like a great, it's basically a becoming a subdivision of Houston and, and growing on north um, as you go. Uh, so it's, it's just, is a big subset of, of the Houston market. Uh, even in, even within itself, it's a great little market by itself. Uh, average income, you know, $95,000, uh, you know, average household income. So it's, you know, again, a good market, you know, for, for people coming in there. And then, what we're always, you know, depending on what we're looking at, like the, you know, coming in and being able to get like as much as you could of a, of a corner, right? You want to be on a corner, frontage road, especially depending on what you're doing. Now, if we had the opportunity and we did all of this, this would then be like a full, like we talked about, a full uh, town center approach. Uh, but this one, we're, we're focused here on these these two uh, projects, building building one here and building two, uh, twenty four thousand square feet uh, that that's being built out. It's broken uh, ground now. There was you know so this is one of the things like we talk about the equity piece. Uh, you know sometimes when you're doing the equity or people are investing in these deals, it's maybe a little bit you know, a little bit more on the risk side, but the returns are typically better as well. So there's a bit of that risk return opportunity because, okay, we got a little more time. We're going through permitting, getting the final permitting, and then construction finally gets started. So updates, you know, on these type of projects, you know, are not always, always monthly, but more like uh, quarterly or at like a major hurdle, like, hey, Okay, we're doing quarterly updates or we hit a major hurdle and we've started like, you know, going with the horizontal construction or we've started our vertical construction or we've actually, you know, we're starting to do uh, tenant improvements now on leases that have been, you know, leased out and, and so forth. So uh, it's a little different in, in the timelines, the process. It's not like you don't have changes on a daily basis or a monthly basis that you're reporting out typically. So this is a common, you know, 
very you know very similar to what you'll see on even you know multifamily but you're going to see different here is we're doing land acquisition and then you got the different you know costs that come into those so there's a, a combination of what comes in as soft and hard costs into the total estimates some contingency and you get to the total capital required uh, you're going to be looking then similar to a, a family a multifamily rent roll in, in a way but you got swamp chicken tune up manly salon grand liquor y factor so you're just looking at a few of your what of your main tenants that are coming in the size like we said 30 34 dollars per square foot you get into the rental amounts and everything so it all comes to the same direction that you're going to end up with a revenue that's coming in you're going to have uh your costs your expenses triple net's going to take care of some of those expenses and you're going to get to your noi and then you'll get to your return so you know 22 percent return uh for members for for you know lp members um versus sometimes you may be looking more at a and a 30% annual return. Uh, so there's not a cash. There's not typically cash on cash in these deals. You're just going to be looking at, hey, I got an equity multiple, you know, in a in a three-year period. So this is a three-year deal. I got an equity multiple of 1.9 in three years and a re IRR of 22%. So one of so that's the Conroe Con. That's just an example. There we can come back and do quick Q and A. And I'm just got two last slides, and then we can go to Q and A about things. But we talked about like what are we doing? Um, whoops, I got these out of order. Smallest to preferred. Uh, so this is now the new smaller type deals that we're looking at. So again, you look here. This is like a whole. Uh, planned community that's going in place and you know we we have a piece carved out for the the retail in there uh this is on about seven acres to eight acres and doing about 70 60 000 square feet and you get an idea just like a conceptually the drawings are coming in now things are happening this was like okay what are we going to do now we've actually changed this a little bit we're going to look at like, hey, this should be like some, we're going to make this combined. This is not going to be driving or parking. It's going to be a, a little community area for kids and people to sit and play and do things between these two buildings, have them connected with a little park area. So just looking to make it, you know, more community oriented uh, in the feel of that. And then, you know, in the, as we go forward, we're looking at the developments and then this is a town center development that we would be considering, which is more like a 30 to 40 acres of, of property that we will be building out a full town center with parks, um, little, you know, recreation fields and things like that um, for people to do walking areas uh, and so forth. So uh, that's, that's just wanted to share directionally where we are, where we've been and where we're going as well uh, on these triple nets and development uh, and leaning into this town center concept uh, moving forward. Again, on this is on the development side, which is sometimes different than the operational side, right? So there is the, the greater the risk reward, the greater the return. So normally in the development side, our goal is a 20 plus IRR. And then sometimes on the operational side, when I say the operational side, so we normally build these and then sell them, but we do sometimes have the option to buy them back. And it's a little bit different. So your returns may be a little bit lower, but your risks are way lower and your cash flow is way up. So these development deals are very different, right? So there is really no cash flow, right? You build it, you rent it. The last few months, there's some cash flow, and then you 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 sell them or buy them yourselves. And that's on the risk reward side. And then the operational side, um, 
you, you know, your tenants are paying their leases, their guaranteed leases, it's triple net where they're taking all of the risks. So the returns may be a little bit lower, but the cash flow may be higher. So again, when you're balancing your, what do you need out of your investments and your risk reward, you wanna make sure you have a balance of, of everything, right? So that's why we've switched over and started doing more of these just to give a balance to the multifamily side. It, hopefully that makes sense. And, and the other Trevor is, you know, so, so I, I should have pulled up a timeline, but like a, a, let's say a retail commercial investment, you know, you go through a timeline is, is usually zero to 36 months and it's zero to six months is going to be land acquisition, beginning development, six to nine months is going to be finishing up your development planning, nine, uh, months to 24 months will be uh, your construction, uh, horizontal, maybe final permits, uh, horizontal construction, and beginning your, your, your leasing. And then 24 to 36 months is your final lease up, your tenant improvements, TI they call it, that's going on, getting your tenants in and operating for a while. So there is some tip. There is typically some slight cash flow towards the end of that, but as Trevor said, we then would sell that, and our future model as well is, is we would you know sell or recapitalize that to ourselves, and then new investors come in that, or even the same investors. Now you're going to have instead of a non cash flowing uh, property, you're going to have a high cash flow property with with but the appreciation doesn't go up as much so your multiple changes a little bit your cash flow is is much better so it depends on then the type of investor you are do i want appreciation or do i need cash flow or you know so those are those are decisions yeah. people need to make as they look into the you know the the uh, the type of deals and that explains the type of returns and underwriting that goes into those yeah. And then also quite differently are the tax situations. So new development doesn't often come with the bonus depreciation because the only thing that's constant is the land and you can't depreciate it. And so on the first phase of it, you're not going to get those bonus depreciations, but you can on the second phase of it on the, let's say you, you, you actually buy it and operate it and do things. So again, it's, it's, looking at all of the things. What do I need? Do I need tax? Do I need this? Do I need cash flow? Do I need kind of, again, when you're looking at where would you want to put your money, um, you would want to be able to kind of have some money in kind of all phases of these types of things and different types of investment classes to give you a more balanced portfolio. Um, and I also want to talk about that this is an excellent investment, especially on the development side for your retirement funds because they are not privy to getting the tax advantages on the bonus depreciation. So if you do have cash and you do have money in retirement, I always advise people, and again, I'm not a financial planner or advisor, but put, put the retirement money into development and put the cash into something that has a higher depreciation, such as multifamily, uh, so that you can get all of the benefits. Um, and again, it doesn't mean don't put retirement money in multifamily and don't put cash in. It doesn't mean that. It's just you need to understand the holistic, you know, what's good for your portfolio basis. And often very nice thing about these is the time frame is often shorter, too. So, yeah. you know, our goal is within three years to be in and out still with a decent multiple. Um, that that's a that's a good way to do it. Um, any questions? I know we give a lot of information all the time. Hey, Trevor, it's Flint. Hey there. Hey, um, are you guys planning on doing more just operational side for, for industrial or are you, you purely focused in the near term just on new dev? So we've not really done much industrial yet, um, although we do have one project that may be industrial focused in Houston. Um, but we've more been on the retail triple net side. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Uh, but on, on that, but I mean, so let me just clarify as well, make sure we, 
our, our two areas of, of main focus currently are continue to be multifamily value add acquisitions. And that still is a high priority for us. And the second is uh, development of, of the retail centers and, and making those even larger into town center size, uh, such as I was showing so that, you know, 60,000 square feet is probably a, of a retail is uh, the smaller end of where we're going to be going forward. Uh, looking at some of the town centers that we're looking are 35, 40 acres, and they're 400 to 700,000 square feet of retail, commercial, or mixed use, and maybe even, you know, could be mixed use, and maybe some just standalone apartment with that as well. Yeah, so our partners, for example, last year when we were in Houston, we toured one of their properties, you know, and it has high-end retail in the front. It had businesses on the first floor with apartments on the second and third. And then in the back space, it actually had what I'm going to refer to as industrial workspace. So an office in the front and a garage door in the back, um, you know, again, on the less valuable retail at the back, um, you know, and it has a lot of the different components. It has a little town center. So there are lots of uses. So the deeper you get to the property, um, you have to change the uses. So that, that's a great example, the one town center, Mike, that we walked of something that has multiple asset classes all within one development um, and, it, and it works as a whole. That's true. That's right. And uh, yeah, the further you get away from the main road, the, the you change to a different uh, group of uh, things that you got there. Yeah, 100%, Trevor. Yeah. I guess a follow on question to that. Sorry, I've been walking my dog and doing yard work while listening. Okay. So I may have missed something. Um, are you bringing investors in after you're permitted, entitled and permitted, or are you bringing people in for land acquisition? Which phase, so I guess? The, yeah, uh, the, and it's, it's been, I'll, so it's Flint, uh, it's been a bit, a uh, mix of both of those and uh, primarily going forward uh, it's going to be we may acquire land that's not fully permitted but but our deals are mostly going to be directly um, bringing people into the full um, acquisition through construction uh, phase of a deal so it we we're all of that fitting within a a uh, three year timeline. So we're not doing just a standalone. Hey, let's go acquire land and get it uh, permitted. And we're also though looking at at projects where we're already have worked with the cities, uh, been doing deals there, already built in that area, and know what is going to be expected required on the permitting side. It's, it's not a direct answer, but uh, it's, it's still a little bit of a mix of both. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah, I do some built-to-rent stuff as well, and, and we've we varied the model. Uh, our most recent one was where we are only bringing investor cash in after it we're permitted. So it, it's just, it changes a little bit on the, the risk side for investors, which... Yep, 100%. Uh, yeah yeah no i agree 100 percent. it's uh the, the uh, uh yep there's no and, doubt about it and unfortunately i have to run in about one minute so i want to make sure that i say this we do this every wednesday if you found something interesting and enjoyable invite a friend okay the whole purpose of this is for us to help educate people about about investing in commercial real estate so super important the next thing is that reminder that Massive Capital always starts our offerings is 506B. So if you have not booked a call with one of the team members of Massive Capital, we have to have a pre-existing relationship. So make sure that you book a call with us. Or if you haven't talked for a while, make sure you book a call with us to make sure that we, we get involved with you and that we can help you to get to the next level. Um, and again, 
it's really important to make sure that you diversify your investments on several realms, right? So I'm a, I am like to do all the, for those of you that don't know, I've invested in 31 syndications and I also have storage and medical and a few other things. And so it's always good to be diversified. So um, I do have to run, which is rare, but- uh, Trevor, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. I know you had to get a call booked for seven. Yeah, so I did. And then- uh, I got Brenda, Brenda hanging here with here. you. Yeah, and I've got my family here from Canada, eh? So my sister, first time to visit me in Texas, actually. Um, so we're, we've had a great day today, and uh, she's here for a few more days. So it's great to see everybody. Thank you all for joining.